5G radio networks, uh, cell phone networks are not related in any way to COVID. Okay? 5G radio waves do not cause COVID symptoms or create COVID viruses. This is a, a disinformation campaign playing on the fears of the gullible and uneducated. And now they're burning cell phone towers in the UK. I can tell you, Iran and France both do not have 5G networks in their country, but they do have a lot of COVID. So there, there's no link there. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective addressing important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm Dr. Alan Scott, and on this podcast episode, I'm talking to you about COVID-19. What the heck? Boy, there's a lot of information and fear out there about this virus. Um, it's scary, right? This is an unprecedented time. People are staying at home. The economy is ground to a standstill. Politicians are throwing out regulations to beat the band. And nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, there's a lot of conflicting information out there as the science progresses and scientists try to figure out what's going on. Uh, data is not always being shared. Um, I'd like to give you a scientist view of the situation, whether we should be scared or not. If you find this podcast helpful, please uh, click like, comment, and share to others who may also benefit from it. Now, before we get to the meat of the issue, uh, I'd like to clear some of the chaff. Now, there's a lot of people out there that don't know what they're talking about, flinging out conspiracy theories, because that's what they do. Uh, when anything happens, they have to be heard. So, one. 5G radio networks, uh, cell phone networks, are not related in any way to COVID. Okay, 5G radio waves do not cause COVID symptoms or create COVID viruses. This is a, a disinformation campaign playing on the fears of the gullible and uneducated. And now they're burning cell phone towers in the UK. I can tell you, Iran and France both do not have 5G networks in their country, but they do have a lot of COVID. So there, there's no link there. 5G transmits over high-frequency radio waves up to 90 gigahertz. Some people might think, wow, that sounds dangerous. Maybe this is causing health problems. Well, radio waves causing cancer is something that's been thought about for a long time and tested, and it's very difficult to see uh, whether it does or not. If it does, it's a very, very unlikely thing to happen. Uh, radio waves do not have the energy to damage cells and DNA like we know ionizing radiation does. Um, even at 90 gigahertz, which sounds like a high number, it's not really a high frequency when you compare it to other forms of electromagnetic radiation that were around all the time. And the biggest source of radio 5G energy isn't the cell phone towers, it's your cell phone that you put up next to your head at 200 milliwatts, unless you're standing right next to the cell phone towers where you can get a little bit more heat and power from them. But mainly, uh, the cell phone at 200 milliwatts next to your head at 90 gigahertz is probably the biggest source of 5G radiation that you're going to see. And 200 milliwatts is not a lot of power in the radio. For a contrasting point, if you walk outside on a sunny day, the sun is going to bathe your head with about 15 watts of electromagnetic radiation. And that electromagnetic radiation is at around 550 terahertz. So thousands of times higher frequency and hundreds of times more power. So, yeah, uh, not to worry about. Um, Some people are more worried about the vaccine when it comes out because they're anti-vax. Some people are worried about tracking microchips that they're going to give us when they give us the vaccine, and they're going to track it over the 5G network. Well, yeah, okay, maybe they will, um, but that'll be totally voluntary to track people who have got the vaccine. Um, I think it's more likely that they will probably uh, track our cell phones through the 5G network. Uh, in fact, they already do this. Uh, if you turn on your if you don't turn off your location preferences, your cell phone is tracking you all the time anyways. Um, 5G is going to be much more accurate than the current uh, generation of 4G in terms of telling the world, broadcasting your position through the network. Uh, and this probably is the main threat to freedom that we should be looking at when we're discussing 5G is the how it has the potential to track you. I don't think it has anything to do with COVID. So back to COVID. COVID is something that spreads uh, 
very easily through the population, uh, through touch mainly and through droplets uh, from coughs and sneezes. And we found that it has an exponential spread, which th what this means is that each infected person passes it on to more than one other person. Uh, and so the numbers keep doubling and doubling and doubling and eventually it gets out of hand. The rate of infection, uh, from what we can tell before any uh, controls are put in place, was about 2.2. Uh, in other words, each infected person passes it on to 2.2 others, and this creates a, a, a fast doubling uh, on the order of a, a few days. Uh, the number of cases doubles. And what do we know about the mortality rate of this virus? Well, confirmed cases, somewhere between 2 and 5% of confirmed cases uh, end in death. Now these are tests, these are, this is not 2 to 5% of all cases because we don't know how many true cases there are, and we're just gathering that data now. One of the problems with this virus is it has a long incubation time. Uh, so up to two weeks, uh, the virus can lay dorm can be uh, dormant or not showing symptoms before the symptoms kick in. Another big problem, and probably the biggest problem with tracking and locking this down is the asymptomatic carriers. So people that have the virus uh, but show no symptoms at all and are passing it around. And this is what basically made the virus spread so quickly through China and so quickly around the world is that, you know, the, the health experts used to working with Ebola and SARS and H1N1, uh, basically there aren't asymptomatic carriers of those viruses. People get the virus, show symptoms, and you can quarantine them, you can check on all their contacts, and you can keep it localized. This particular virus spread secretly, surreptitiously, by infecting people but not making them have symptoms, so it got out of hand. How many people could be actually infected with this is hard to tell. The data is not conclusive yet, and there's been some conflicting reports. Data from Iceland, where they've tested about 6% of the population, and data from a cruise ship called the Diamond Princess, uh, where a lot of, where just about everybody was tested, show that about half of the cases of, uh, of the virus are asymptomatic. So, there are other uh, tests that show that more people than that, a larger fraction, have some antibodies to the virus. I'm a little bit skeptical of those results because they may, they're they looking for something different, right? Um, so, what do we do? What should we do? Should we be afraid of this? Well, the lockdown is a reasonable response uh, to get us down to the uh, so that the infection rate is much less than one. You basically got to get out of this exponential uh, scenario as fast as you can before it overwhelms the ICUs and, and we don't have enough doctors to handle this because that hurts not just the people that are infected but the people with normal health problems uh, that uh, can't get access to the hospitals. So we need this lockdown initially to get the total number of cases to a manageable level where we're not overwhelmed. And by doing that, by getting R down much lower than 1, the total number of cases will start to decline and we'll get back to a manageable level of infections. Once the infection rate is at a manageable level, we can start to think about loosening up the lockdown protocols to allow that uh, infection rate number to drift up. As long as it stays below 1, in other words, each infected person in passes it on to less than one person on average, the number of pay cases won't get away from us. And this is uh, the subject of a good article I read uh, early on in this uh, called The Hammer and the Dance by a gentleman named Thomas Puejo. The hammer is this, this lockdown period where we just got to stop everything and stop passing this around and even stop the asymptomatic people, which we can't test. Because we can't test them, we just need everybody to stop for a second. Well, for a few weeks, maybe a few months. Uh and stop the people without symptoms spreading this around. Once we get the number down, then we can do this little dance where we start loosening up the protocols a little bit. People start going to work, going back to school, um, and seeing what happens to the infection rate. So to do this properly, we need to be, you know, about more than two times more careful uh, than we were about spreading around disease when we start going back to work or it's going to get away again. And this is 
something that happened even back in the Spanish flu in 1918. The, the initial uh, round, people were quarantined and, and it went away. But then people uh, lost patience, went back out, and they had a second round of, of uh, bad, uh, bad virus infections. What's the end game? So we play this game, we do the hammer, we do the dance. We Is this infinite? Is this going to be going on forever? Is this our new normal? That's a fear that some people have. This would be uh, quite an interesting situation if it were. But that's not the case. Eventually, there's going to be a solution, and it's going to be either a vaccine or probably the worst result is we have to wait till we get herd immunity built up. Now, a vaccine, we all understand how that works. Uh, someone's going to come up with a way to prevent everyone from getting sick, uh, and they get their injections, and then you stop uh, spreading it around. Uh, herd immunity is when you've got enough people who have acquired immunity from having the infection that uh, the infection rate is down because you don't bump into susceptible people, basically. When you're infected, you don't bump into susceptible people very much, so the rate of infection can stay low. You really need more than about 60% of the population to have uh, encountered the disease and, and built up antibodies to it for this to work. And we don't know how successful or how long-lasting the uh, immunity you get from your antibodies is with this disease yet. So this may not even be possible. But let, let's let's envision the herd immunity. So some people think, let's just let everybody get sick. It's not that bad. It's like a flu. Well, it might be that bad. It, it's, it seems to be worse than a flu at this point. We're not 100% sure, but it seems to be. So to get to 60% infection rate, assuming the data that we have is right at this point, assuming half the people are asymptomatic, then only 30% of the population has to have symptoms to get to this minimum level for herd immunity. And say maybe 75% of the symptomatic cases so far haven't been confirmed in a hospital, right? So maybe only a quarter of the people with symptoms end up going to the hospital. We're still looking at, you know, 30% of the population having symptoms and then about 1% of that number dying. That's a big number. If this is correct, to get to that minimum 60% level for herd immunity, roughly 100,000 Canadians would have to die before we reach that. And that's a big, scary number. And it's going to be worse in the U.S. and bigger places with more population, obviously. It all scales with population. So, Here's the summary. Lockdowns allow ICUs to cope with the increased load while saving the maximum number of people. How is this affecting our lives and our, our interactions? Well, people are frightened. And when people are frightened, politicians take advantage. Politicians can pass laws more easily. They can grab onto power. And we've seen this a lot. And it happens again and again. And it's a problem. Politicians will engage in what I call security theater. They're going to restrict rights with little oversight or justification to look like they're doing something. And this happens all the time. This happened, uh, you know, whenever they have uh, uh, terrorists on planes. You know, you can no longer bring liquids on planes. You now have to scan your shoes. Um, security theater, right? It in inconveniences you, it gets rid of some of your rights, and it doesn't really do much. There's no, there's no way to check on it. It just start a, becomes permanent, you know? And that's what we want to try to avoid. We have to be a little bit careful. Politicians have closed parks, outdoor parks. They've banned outdoor fires. You know, there's a lot of things that we really need as a society uh, to keep from going mad locked up in our houses. And a little bit of outdoors is probably a lot better than uh, the alternative. Politicians have banned the right to free assembly. We can't have more than five people uh, get together without having the police come. This is a dangerous weapon. The right to free, free assembly is something that we fought for, that people have died for in our democratic society. Imagine this weapon in the hands of someone who does not respect these hard-won rights or freedoms. 
It's not difficult to imagine the implications of this particular situation if a budding tyrant were interested in bending the democratic rules, which we've seen happen again and again, again and again recently. What would prevent someone like that from staying in power, perhaps using this emergency to delay their next election? Maybe they would send in the police to break up protests. Well, the cost of democracy is eternal vigilance. By letting politicians play on our fears, we risk losing these hard-won freedoms. So we need to be careful, to be vigilant, and to help each other out, and to scrutinize what our politicians are doing, and ask questions. Yes, we do need to isolate right now, but I don't think we want to be fining people for taking their dog alone for a walk in the park. Now, what about the economy? People are saying we need to get back to work. We've wiped out trillions in stock values. The livelihoods of millions are, are through the floor. And we're fining people for leaving their homes. Some people would say, isn't it better to just let a few extra old people die than damaging the economy? Well, that's a pretty harsh opinion I don't agree with. This is where the dance comes in, as I said. How best can we restart the economy while protecting the vulnerable? Well... Sweden is trying this experiment. They, they decided to jump into a long-term situation with, um, without killing, without the hammer, basically. They're starting the dance right from the start. They've jumped right to this scenario. They didn't have a lot of cases to start with, so they're trying to do uh, uh, bringing the, the R value down below 1 without locking down completely. And good on them if it works. Uh, I hope it does. Uh, it would be a, it's a very good object lesson for the rest of us to follow to see if we can, um, once our number of cases gets down to a manageable level, uh, whether we can implement some of the things that they've done that are working. And it, it's a work in progress, obviously. We need to protect the vulnerable. Um, we have to have... Uh, we have to make sure that our politicians exercise judgment and listen to our, their scientific advisors and provide follow evidence-based approaches to this coming dance. Once the cases drop, basically we can implement loosenings of certain protocols, but each time we loosen something, we should wait roughly two weeks to see if the number of cases of the virus spike, because that's the, uh, the sort of um, border of the incubation period for this virus. So. You don't want to make a whole bunch of changes and then have the number of virus cases shoot up, not knowing which particular change caused that, because then you're back to the hammer and the dance again. We also need to be careful that politicians don't use this crisis as an opportunity to line their pockets, to erode our democratic freedoms, or loosen the environmental regulations that we depend on uh, for living. So that's all I have to say about this. I hope you all stay safe and healthy, and uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tune in for my next podcast on why all the other guys are idiots. Thank you. Thank you.